Stephen Wilhelm was born in Canada, got his undergraduate degree from the University of Western Ontario with honors in genetics, got his PhD at the University of Western Ontario in plant sciences, did postdoctoral appointments, uh, fellowships at the University of Texas, Austin, in marine science, in, uh, and uh, at the University of British Columbia. Uh, he also worked with Environment Canada. He started as an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee in 1998. So we have now had the great privilege of having this real treasure on the faculty of the University of Tennessee for 20 years. Uh, he uh, is now uh, in the Department of Microbiology the uh, Director of Graduate Studies, also the Associate Head of the Department, besides being the Mossman Professor of Microbiology. Uh, he is also uh, uh, adjunct faculty for the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, the Program in Genome Science and Technology, and the Center for environmental biotechnology. He's also been a visiting professor at a university in Finland. Uh, he uh, is an enormously productive researcher. Uh, last time I counted, he was averaging, I mean, this boggles the mind, mm -hmm. more than 12 publications a year, peer uh, reviewed. And he has brought to the University of Tennessee more than $20 million in grants uh, and does some remarkable things with them. I'll tell you about that on another occasion. Uh, among his many awards are from the University of Tennessee, the Science Alliance Faculty Award for Research from the University of Tennessee, the Chancellor's Award for Research and Creative Achievement that doesn't even begin to fully tell the story of Stephen Wilhelm. But I've got to tell a personal story, and that is when I was first introduced to biology, uh, I found out about how viruses work, and I thought to myself, the human race is doomed. There's no way we can survive viruses. Uh, and then I come to find out because of Stephen Wilhelm and his research, that we are now facing giant viruses. Uh, and so I am scared out of my wits <laughs> about what Dr. Stephen Wilhelm will tell us today, speaking about here there be giants, huge viruses that act like living cells. Stephen Wilhelm. You know, I really think I should hire Professor Littman to travel with me <laughs> and maybe enter a room two to three to five minutes before I show up. I would feel a lot better about myself. <laughs> the only problem as well is that you have to live up to a Mark Littman introduction. So th thank you, Mark. It's, it's good to be back here. Um, I was here uh, a couple years ago. and We talked about toxic cyanobacterial blooms, I believe. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about viruses today. And with, with all the, the really kind words you said, um, the people who do the work are in this photo. So these are grad students, some gone, some still here, um, and my senior research associate, Gary LeClaire. Um, these are the people that, that do all the work, that have all the great thoughts. I just get to play up here. So what I want to do today is talk to you briefly, uh, bring everyone up to speed and why we care about microorganisms, and particularly viruses, and then, um, take on some version of the Louis Pasteur adage, chance favors the prepared mind, and, and ask the question, could there be giant viruses, and what would it mean to be giant if you're a virus? And then I'm going to specifically end talking about the research we're doing here uh, on the Oreococcus anaphagefrens virus system. It's the smallest of the giants. It's like the Hagrid, if you're a Harry Potter fan, uh, of the giant systems. Uh, and, and work that's going on um, in my lab here. I think it goes without saying that we live on a microbial planet. The majority of processes that happen on this planet are driven by microorganisms. 
Um, if you don't know that, you should know that. <laughs> it, they're really, really important. Um, bacteria, algae, fungi are incredibly important in transforming carbon, which is our proxy for uh, growth and biomass and energy movement. And they help maintain healthy ecosystems. If we didn't have microbes, the world would fill up with dead stuff. We don't want that to happen. And so there's a lot of things we talk about when we think about microbial communities. Over here is a, a schematic drawn by my colleagues, uh, Alison Buchan and Gary LeClaire, that was published in Nature Reviews Microbiology a couple years ago that just summarizes these processes, how carbon dioxide, and we're focusing on the oceans uh, right now, carbon dioxide moves in and out of seawater, how phototrophs, phytoplankton, fix that carbon dioxide. They take gas, turn it into biomass. Some of this is consumed by zooplankton. Some of this leaks out and turns into dissolved or particulate organic carbon and nutrients. And some of this is recycled by viruses down here. Um, in particular, in my lab, we're interested uh, in this viral process down here. And that, uh, that interest goes back historically to observations made about 20 or 30 years ago. What you're looking at here is a sample of water that's been stained with a dye that will fluoresce when it's bound to nucleic acid. Fluoresces very brightly when it's bound to DNA, not so brightly when it's bound to RNA. On the left here, you're looking at a just a natural sample of water. And on the right here, you're looking at a purified preparation of bacteriophage T7. It's a small bacteriophage, a virus that infects E. coli. What you can see as you compare these two images is that all of these purified virus particles, except for this guy here who's probably a contaminant, he snuck through the preparation, happens all the time, but all these particles here look like many of the particles in the background here. And it was these types of observations that led researchers to start to believe that viruses may be very abundant in the world's oceans. And in fact, we've learned that in the oceans, in lakes, in rivers, in puddles that form outside after a rainstorm, there are between 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 11 viruses in every liter of water. Now, it's not just viruses. There are about 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 10 bacteria in those same systems. And that's why, in part, I say it's a microbial world. But these are very abundant particles. And the other thing we've learned about these particles is that they're uh, very fragile. They get destroyed very easily. So if you have something that's really abundant, that's destroyed very easily, but it's always there, it must be produced rather quickly. And that was the initial thinking in that viruses may be important in natural systems. And we can jump forward and we can look at ideas that have uh, come in and out of the literature. Um, I was lucky enough years ago uh, to work with Curtis Suttle. Uh, Curtis was my postdoc advisor. We were at the University of Texas together, then I moved with him in his lab. And we moved to the University of British Columbia. And we came up with this idea of the viral shunt. This idea that while we have standard food webs of photosynthesizing things, being eaten by larger things, being eaten by larger things, there are loss processes all the way along. And one of these major loss processes is viruses. Viruses that lyse autotrophs or algae and can lyse heterotrophs or bacteria and contribute to this pool of dissolved organic matter and particulate organic matter. In fact, our early estimates, and they, they still bear out to be true, it seems, um, are that as much as 25% of the carbon that's fixed by photosynthesis in the ocean gets pushed back into this pool here by viral activity. If you've got a bucket with a 25% leak in it, you really never know how much water is in your bucket. If you're trying to model global carbon cycles and you've got a 25% leak in your processes, <laughs> you're not going to have a good model of global carbon cycles. Now my lab spent the last 20 years um, trying to understand this process, and we're not the only ones. In fact, this comes from a paper that Curtis published a few years ago looking at all the great pools of carbon on the planet. I want to point out a couple things here. There's about 805 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere. There's about 700 gigatons of dissolved organic carbon in the surface oceans. If we look at a few processes that have been added in here, the one thing that I like about this figure is this number right here. Curtis has estimated that about 150 gigatons, close to 20% of the atmospheric carbon content, is mobilized by viruses every year. That's an incredible amount of carbon being moved around in the systems. 
And so these observations were made 10, 15, 20 years ago. We've been running around the world trying to understand them and trying to figure out what viruses do in these systems. But most of our observations have been focused on bacteriophage. They've been focused on bacteriophage because we have models to grow their hosts in the lab. We can then isolate the viruses. We have an idea of what their genomes look like, so we can build tools to study them. Could there be other viruses out there that are important? So I want to tell you a little story. It takes place partly in England and partly in France. And the whole story um, revolves around this thing here. How often do we really observe something new in science? Heard people say many times, many famous scientists, that's it, we've discovered everything, our job is done, right before we discover something new. You know, one thing that always pops to mind when I see this sort of statement is that when I was a graduate student, um, they discovered an organism called Prochlorococcus. Prochlorococcus is the most abundant photosynthetic organism on the planet. We knew nothing about it until the 1980s. So the most abundant photosynthetic organism on the planet. It's really, really small. If you go visit Dr. Eric Zinser's lab up in Science and Engineering, that's what his lab works on. We knew nothing about it prior to 1980. It was something really, really new. It's really changed how we think about processes in the ocean. So in the 1990s, um, Bertels et al. were working in Bradford, England. There had been an, an ammonia outbreak. And they were trying to isolate the causative organism. At the time, the approach for isolating this causative organism was to add amoeba because they couldn't grow the Legionella, they couldn't grow the Chlamydia, things like this that would cause these diseases on their own. But they had found that if you add amoeba in, um, these bacteria take off and grow wonderfully. So they isolated what they call Bradford coccus. It looked similar to them to another bacterium they had. And they were able to grow it sort of and maintain it with the amoeba. They could never grow it by itself. They could never get any molecular biology to work on it. Um, but it was a gram-positive microbe. At the time, gram stains were still very common. It's one of the most basic things. Anybody here taken introductory microbiology? If you've taken introductory microbiology, you've probably done a gram stain. It's the most basic thing that we do. So this is a gram-positive organism. It was resistant to everything they tried in the lab. Um, so they put it on the shelf, forgot about it. In 1995, one of the researchers from this group left, and he went to France uh, to help set up some new labs and get things going, and he was allowed to take a bunch of stuff with him, a bunch of the samples, commonly happens. And so one thing he took was Bradford Caucus. And he took it to um, France, and they started looking at it again. And at one point, somebody looked at it and said, if I didn't know any better, I would swear this was a virus. The only thing that's wrong is it's way too big, and it stains like a bacteria, but other than that, it behaves like a virus. When they looked at it under transmission electron microscopy, it had some structures similar to a virus. Um, and it was that aha moment um, that let them discover Mimi virus. This is Mimi virus right here. Mimi virus is the first of these large, giant viruses to really um, become of interest to people. Why are they giant viruses? Well, the particles are much bigger than we think of, two to three to 10 or more times bigger than a standard virus. And their genome, genomic complement is huge relative to a standard virus. If I ask people in this room to name some viruses, undoubtedly you'll all name HIV at some point. The genome of HIV has 9,749 base pairs. It's a relatively small genome for a virus. To put this in perspective, if you were at the 2012 World Conference on HIV, there was three researchers there for every base pair in the genome of that virus. There's a lot of research going on in HIV. So if we compare this 10, 10 KB to these guys up here, we suddenly see that Mimi virus is 100 times larger. In fact, when we first started to look at Mimi virus, it was the largest virus that had ever been seen. The largest virus to this point had been PBCV1, and it at the time was thought to be a bit of a freak in terms of its size. So what happened is that scientists suddenly said, wow, viruses aren't just one or two or five genes and a little bit of protein. There's a lot more going on. In the case of Mimi virus, for example, remember I said it was gram positive? The reason it's gram positive is it has these peptidoglycan hairs here. These peptidoglycan hairs cause it to stain gram positive. Why would a virus have peptidoglycan hairs? Peptidoglycan is something that you see in bacterial membranes. Well, it turns out, or the idea is, 
that these peptidoglycan hairs make the virus look like a tasty snack. An amoeba will come along, consume it, draw the virus into its food vacuole, where the virus can then escape. And it's inside the amoeba, and it's ready to go. So they have partially proven this idea. There's some arguments about it, but it's the best one I've heard so far. These viruses also have all kinds of other genes um, that are not typically found in viruses, that are normally attributed to living cells. And I'll come back to that in a second. But I just want to show you one other weird virus that always drives me crazy. It's this guy here, Pithovirus sibiricum. This was discovered by uh, my friend Jean-Michel Clavier's group in 2014. If you were to show this to most of the virologists on the planet, they would look at it and say, there's no way this is a virus. Um, the name pithovirus actually comes from the fact that it looks somewhat like an urn that you would put wine in um, a thousand years ago. That's where Jean-Michel came up with the name, apparently. But you're looking at it here. It's even got this lovely little cork structure across the top. Now, what's interesting about pithovirus is it's 1,500 1, nanometers, 1.5 microns in length. Most bacteriophage are around 100 nanometers in length. So this thing is 10 times larger than most bacteriophage. In fact, many obligate intercellular bacteria, um, things that make you sick, are only about half the size of this virus. Now, researchers have done a lot of work on things like pithovirus, trying to understand why they're so big, why they have these massive genomes. Surprisingly, even though this is the biggest virus particle, it's not the biggest viral genome. Its genome is still 600 kilobases, which is pretty impressive. Um, and you can go in and with molecular biology now, and I'll talk a bit more about this later, um, and start to ask questions about where does this virus get its genes? Where does this virus do with these genes? And what we're looking at here, and the reason I put this up, are these are divisions of all the proteins in pithovirus. What I want to point out is that the ones in color here are ones in this case that we can identify phylogenetically, so maybe who they're closely related to, or down here, we can identify a function. Note that a full two-third of the proteins this virus makes, we have no idea what the function is. That's been one of the interesting and exciting thing about viruses as we've started to look at them in different and different environments. Many of these genes, many of these proteins are completely new to science. We have no idea what they're doing. In many cases, they resemble nothing we've ever seen. And while I'm showing you this, we can also start to think then about what these proteins do. We see processes here that we would normally attribute, again, only to living cells. Things like nucleotide synthesis, DNA repair, hydrolases, reductases. These are not genes that most viruses typically carry. So this has really started to turn the world upside down in terms of understanding um, what a virus is, what a virus can do, and what the potential is of the viral community in the real world. On top of this, it's created a lot of excitement. I showed you a list of three or four or five viruses. Um, this list is growing rapidly and every day. What we're looking at here is a phylogenetic tree, and this is an older one, just showing these different families of viruses that all fit into these groups of giants. The proper name for the giants is the nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses. I'll just keep calling them giants. So my tongue will get really <laughs> tired. Um, but we have things like the Mimiviridae, which I'll talk a fair bit about, the Phycodinaviridae. This is an interesting name. If you're a scientist, you can probably guess these are DNA viruses that infect algae. Um, then we have things that you may have heard, heard about, like African swine fever virus. The pox viruses, which have been studied for some time, are one group of viruses that have been pulled into this group, although the pox researchers never want to talk to us. They've got their own little world. They have their own little pox virus parties, their little pox virus conferences. They don't hang out with the rest of us here. And then we have viruses up here that do things like create shrimp white spot virus. They create disease in small invertebrates. So there's this massive group. Now, so I've told you these things are big. They have big genomes. They have a lot of interesting potential and a lot of unknown stuff. Um, the other thing that I think is really cool about these guys is that they sort of blur the boundaries of what a virus is. And I've given you this list of genes here, but again, DNA repair. Why would a virus need DNA repair mechanisms? Transfer RNAs. Um, this is something that's baffled researchers for years. We use transfer RNAs to build proteins. 
Why would a virus be carrying this? We think of viruses coming in and taking over their host. And probably most excitingly, they can be infected by virophage. There are viruses that infect other viruses. What you're looking at here is a Mimi virus inside an amoeba, and inside you can see these little virophage. This one's Sputnik here is its name. So when it was originally seen, it was seen orbiting a virus, or it was seen to look like it was orbiting a virus, so they named it Sputnik. Um, but we actually, and this is actually starting to show up in other systems, where we see small virus particles that can get into an infected cell, take over the infection complex that the large virus is building, and infect that. So and that's a whole different line of research that we can talk about later. But what has come from this is a lot of interesting stuff. There have been dozens and dozens of papers written about these giant viruses, lots of new discoveries. Um, I think the most important thing is that what we think looks like a virus has begun to change. Old biases have begun to fade away. Um, and then people have really tried to push this idea. There was a whole group that tried to push this idea for a long time that these giant viruses were a fourth domain of life, that they evolved early on and that they came out as their own group. Now this has been taken apart quite a bit and I'll show you a bit of that data today. Um, but there are other things that have come from this. Remember I told you about pithovirus. So pithovirus was isolated from 30,000 year old um, glacial sediments in Greenland. The big panic that came out of this was, well what about global warming? What if these glaciers melt? What do you mean there's giant viruses underneath these glaciers? Um, when that pithovirus paper came out, there was lots of phone calls. And in fact, Curtis Suttle, who I mentioned earlier, sent an email out to a bunch of us just and warned us and said, there are a number of reporters trolling scientists trying to get you to say something inflammatory about the hidden potential in these glaciers. Um, and so while we don't want to say things like that, there's a lot of interesting things in these massive genomes. This is not to say there isn't a potential for these viruses to be associated with diseases. Now there's no hard evidence out there, but there's lots of interesting observations. There's observations with Marseille virus of some sick children or some humans having them in their system. Probably the most interesting story has to do with chlorovirus ATCV1. Researchers in New York were studying people who had some cognitive learning issues and when they were looking at transcripts, they continued to find sequences that were consistent with this virus, ATCV1, being part of the human or oral pharyngeal system. Now, ATCV1 infects a freshwater alga, infects chlorella. It doesn't infect humans, as far as we know. But nonetheless, a lot of work was done on this, and the researchers took this virus, they gave it to mice, and then they tried to train mice to learn to run a maze. And what they found was that mice that were given the virus could not learn to run the maze as fast as mice that were not given the virus. I think there's a lot of potential for this research. I think there's a lot of potential problems in this research. But of course, sometimes we don't get to make up the news stories. In fact, Newsweek dubbed this the stupidity virus. Um, and there were lots of stories about people being afraid to go into lakes and ponds and rivers and swimming and stuff like that. Um, and so that's sort of my backdrop of what's happening in other labs and sort of where the science is. And what I want to do now is tell you a little bit about what we're doing. So we'll slowly get more sciencey as we go along here. The story I'm going to tell you about today involves a small single cell algae that lives in New York uh, called Oreococcus anaphogeferens. It creates something called brown tides. This here is not mud in water. This is high density algae growing in the system. It turns the water mud brown. These cells grow to such a density that they absorb all the light, choke out all the plants that live in the bottom. Um, they've destroyed all the eelgrass beds in that, all up and down through New England, um, which has basically destroyed a lot of the fishery industry, a lot of the areas where small fish will rear. Um, it's estimated that they're costing about $50, uh, $50 million a year in losses annually right now, this bloom. The blooms have been going on up there for about 20 years. And there's a lot of interest in this. In fact, there's so much interest in this that the Department of Energy, I always wonder what the Department of Energy is thinking, but the Department of Energy paid us to sequence the genome of this algae. And it's a really interesting organism. One thing that's interesting about this algae is it's got massive redundancy in its genome. What do I mean by that? Well, the genome was much bigger 
than we ever thought it should be. It was probably five to 10 times bigger than we thought it needed to be. Um, and it was that big because it had multiple copies of all kinds of genes that you only need one copy of. It has 62 different light harvesting complex genes. It has three copies of the gene needed to take up urea. Um, cells usually only have one. So there's this massive redundancy in this genome, and it's a really interesting organism, and a lot of research is going on in that. This organism was originally described in 1988, um, based on an isolation done in 1985. And this collection of um, algal scientists up here are all pretty well known, and they're known for being very good scientists. And one thing that I always thought was interesting about this paper was this very last page. These photographic plates are from the last page of the paper, and if you're sitting close enough at the front, what you can see is that these are the cells here, and many of these cells have these icosahedral particles in them, and as you can guess, these are viruses. The researchers didn't know what to make of this, but they put the information in the paper hoping others would pick up on this and try to study it. And they had some idea that these viruses may play a role in the ecology of this system. So this set off a lot of interesting research. And in 1994, a paper was published in the journal Science um, that really changed virology, at least for a couple of days. Because they argued that a bacteriophage looking particle was the particle infecting Oreococcus. And that this bacteriophage particle here, which was about 65 to 70 nanometers in length, was causing the formation of these hundred and some nanometer particles without tails. And so they got a paper in Science, which most of you know is a big deal. Um, they had some follow-up papers in Journal of Phycology and stuff like that. Um, when we came on the scene starting to study this system around 2000, when Chris Gobler contacted me, and Chris does a lot of work on this, we went back through all the papers and we noticed this story here. We thought this story doesn't make any sense. When the virus particle is outside the cell, if this is right, it's less than half the size of the virus. So we started to look into it a bit deeper and we figured out what was going on here. The researchers were growing algae in the lab, just like they said they were, but their algae were contaminated with bacteria. When they added an agent that killed the algae, that released all the carbon and made the bacteria grow like crazy. When the bacteria started to grow like crazy, the viruses in the system that would kill the bacteria started to kill the bacteria and make lots of these phage-like particles. So by killing the algae, they stimulated the bacteria, and they made virus particles, but what they were looking at is the wrong virus particle here. But this was a paper in science. And so while I feel like this way about it, um, it took us a long time to disprove it. We spent a lot of time working with Chris, with Mary Gastrich, who was uh, up in New York as well at the time, studying these populations in the field, trying to figure out how to get pictures of them. The virus is incredibly camera shy. We're better at taking photos of it now, but it took us five to seven years to figure this out. But one thing we knew early on is that when we looked at populations of the virus and we looked for visibly infected cells, so cells that had these virus particles in them, in nature, that late in the year, up to 36% of the population would have viruses in them. And these peaks with viruses in them would happen right before the community would crash out. So we knew this virus had an important ecological role. It took us close to four years to get this virus in pure culture, or pure enough culture that we didn't have other things in it. What you're looking at here is a picture by Janet Rowe, former grad student, SEM image of a virus particle absorbing onto Oreococcus. Um, at the time, we tried a lot of molecular biological techniques, and I'll talk about more of them in a second, um, but we could not get anything to work. Things like PCR, things like rudimentary sequencing um, were becoming more commonplace in labs. We had tried multiple PCR primers. We tried all kinds of things, and we could not get anything to work that would suggest that this was an algal virus, even though it infected an algae. Um, but because of its morphology and its shape, we soldiered on and said it must be an algal virus, it just must be a little bit weird. So all of this was happening at the time of the great omics revolution. You've probably heard people talk a little bit about this. Tools in genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, tools for measuring multiple processes in an individual cell, in a population, or even an entire community in one shot. You hear a lot about genomics where you can look at the genetic potential of an individual or a community. What I'm going to talk mostly about today is transcriptomics. We focus on mRNA, so we try to look at what the cells are trying to do um, in that immediate time when we collect the sample. 
But at this point in time, we'd come up with the ability to do genomics, and so I was kind of like a poker player and went all in and invested every resource we had in the lab, and we sequenced the genome of this virus. Um, and I'm so glad we did. Um, it was a risk that really paid off. And so what you're looking at here is the genome of AAV, Ariococcus anaphagefrens virus. It's actually a linear genome, but we draw it as a circle because it fits on the slide better. Um, there's a lot to unpack here, a lot to talk about. We could talk about a lot of science things. The thing I want to point out, well, I want to point two things out. One is it's relatively big. It's 371 kilobases. So it's much larger than HIV. It's up in the class with those larger viruses. And that all the genes here in this image are color coded by where they come from phylogenetically, where we think this virus has borrowed them from over history. And what you can start to see is these greens are from bacteria. The reds here are from the host. These blue genes are consistent with other giant viruses, other NCLDVs. But then we see orange boxes, genes that come from other eukaryotes, genes that even come from archaea, and of course a bunch of genes where we can't tell where they come from. This virus's genome is a mosaic. It has been collecting genes probably for a long time from all over. If it was something that wasn't collecting genes, these would all probably be blue and look like NCLDVs. Um, the other thing about these genes is they're not typically viral, as you know, my introduction would allude to. That we can look at all these amazing processes that we would normally only see uh, in what we would call cellular life. Things like methyltransferases, pectate lyases, photolyases are a type of DNA repair mechanism. This guy's got two of them. This virus has two DNA repair mechanisms. Things like potassium ion channels. NIH spends millions and millions and millions of dollars every year studying potassium ion channels because they're in your heart. And it's one of the things that people who are interested in studying heart attacks want to study. So why would a virus have this? You know, and then there's all kinds of sugar processing genes associated with this guy. So this was all very interesting to us. But now that we have the genes, we can start to ask questions about who this virus is most closely related to. And this was kind of our big shock. What you're looking at here is a phylogenetic tree for the major capsid protein. So this is a virus-specific protein that forms that outer shell or helps form that other shell. And all the algal viruses are over here. AEV is right here and fits up in this group with the Mimiviridae, the giant viruses I introduced you to in the beginning. We've done this with other markers and with other things. Oreococcus anaphylogefrens virus clearly fits in this group with these giant viruses in terms of its phylogeny and its evolution. This was kind of a shock to us. For one thing, it explained why none of our PCR and molecular biology worked for two to three years in the lab. We thought we were working with something from over here. We were working with something from up here. It's like having the wrong shaped screwdriver head. It just isn't going to, you know, you might get something, but you're just going to make a mess in the end. Um, and so this was a big discovery for us. And at the same time, uh, colleagues of mine in the Netherlands were publishing on PGV16T. They were finding the same thing. And in fact, this tree has completely blown up in the last few years with the discovery of more and more of these large viruses. We could talk a lot then about these viruses, their evolution, their history, what they can do. Um, but the question that always drives me in my lab is, can we see these things in nature? Can we go out into the environment, quantify them, and ask questions as to what we're doing? We do a lot of sequencing and we do a lot of molecular biology, but we generally do it to build tools. We do it to build tools to ask quantitative ecological questions. And so knowing that AAV fit into this group, we worked with some friends in New York, Sonia Diamond's group, who was doing some sequencing in Narragansett Bay and Quantuck Bay. We like these situations because in Quantuck Bay, which is the one on the right here, um, there were big oreococcus blooms going on, our brown tide organism. In Narragansett Bay, there were blooms of diatoms, single cell eukaryote, but a different type of single cell eukaryote. What we wanted to be able to do was see if within all this sequencing information from environmental sequencing, could we see our virus hiding in there? We have our blooms there, so we should be able to find our virus. It just makes sense. And so lots of the science-y stuff here, we generated some transcriptomes. We had about 270 million individual reads. So that's 270 million individual snippets of information. Um, as my graduate students will tell you, that is not really easy to handle sometimes. It's a lot of data to push around. Um, but we figured out how to do it. We're still learning to do that. 
and we ask this simple question, can we see viruses? Now I point out that these are transcriptomes. These are RNA, not DNA. And this is a double-stranded DNA virus. What this means when we do virus metatranscriptomics then is that we're looking at active infections. Virus particles by themselves in this class contain DNA. They don't really contain a lot of RNA. If we find RNA in the sample, that means the virus is inside a cell, infecting the cell, the infection is in progress. Um, we also collected samples, and we try to do this a lot, where we tend to exclude the virus sized particles now, so we're only getting things associated with the cell. So not only are we looking at what's out in nature, we're looking at something that actually is infectious, we think, we hope. So what we do is we generate all this information, and we get 270 million tiny bits of RNA sequence somewhere between 100 and 150 base pairs in length. Then we all become computer scientists. We take this information and we use programs that allow us to assemble it, to put the pieces back together into bigger contigs. We use a variety of programs that don't really matter then to take these small pieces and recruit them back to these bigger pieces to see how representative each individual big piece is of the system. At the same time, we classify these big pieces and ask a really simple question. Are you from a virus or are you not from a virus? What I'll show you today for the um, giant viruses is just looking at the major capsid protein. As far as we know, nothing else makes a major capsid protein like the ones the giant viruses make. So if we see this, we're pretty convinced it's coming from one of these large viruses. We can then take all of this information and start to one count the virus activity, but then two, phylogenetically resolve it to ask how related these things are. Are these all the same giant virus that we're seeing, or are they from different families of giant viruses? Now this starts to get complicated, as you can imagine, but I'm going to try to walk you through this, and hopefully we can um, all be on the same page at the end. What our data is going to look like is it's going to start with a tree in the middle. This is a phylogenetic tree where the distances between any endpoint here are the relatedness of the pieces we're looking at. And each one of these pieces is from a different giant virus. The dashed ones are from reference genes. These are viruses we have in the lab, we have in culture, we know exactly what they are because we can take them, mix them with their host and cause death. The solid lines here are environmental sequences that we're hoping to learn something about. We can then put this ring around the outside here, and this ring is phylogenetic groups. These are the different groups of viruses and their broader families. The Phycodinoviridae that infect algae, the Mimiviridae that either infect algae or maybe affect amoeba, um, the Eridoviridae, the shrimp, shrimp white spot virus, um, African swine fever virus will show up on here too. Now to make this more complicated, what we need to do is show how much information we have from every sample out there. And we do this by building a heat map out from the core. So every one of these rings represents a unique sample point where we collected a water sample, in this case in Quantuck Bay, and this is the data that comes from it. A box being there suggests that whatever is underneath that box is present, and the colors represent how many copies of that are present. So light colors represent very few to no copies being present, so there's no copies present here. These dark ones, there's lots of copies here, suggesting there's a lot of infection by that virus potentially going on. Okay, so what does this data look like? Well, this data looks like this, and this is one of our simplest ones. We won't get into too many of the complicated ones today. We're looking at a phylogenetic tree here with different groups of viruses. The yellow here are our algae infecting Phycodinoviridae or algae infecting giant viruses. These guys over here are the Mimiviridae, the new giants I've been telling you about. AAV is over here. And then what we can see is we actually do see hits. We do see reads associated with all these different giant viruses in Quantuck Bay. So for us, this is pretty exciting. And we can take a lot of information away from this, but let me go to Narragansett Bay because we have a bit more information. And you start to see patterns emerging you start to see where some viruses are not present. There is no, nothing that looks like African swine fever virus in uh, Narragansett Bay, which is pretty good to know. Um, 
But then we see things that for a microbiologist are really interesting. So for example, this virus here, whatever it is, is always present in the system. It seems to have some stable existence in the environment. Where this one over here seems to have a boom and bust phenomenon. It's really, really present at one point, and then hardly anything there the rest of the time. This all tells us something about the different ecologies of all the different viruses that are represented here. And this is just for the giant viruses. The cool thing about this is we can do this for just about every virus we know about now. So for example, what also emerges from this type of data, you're looking at now genomic architectures for picornavirales, small single-stranded RNA viruses. These are nearly entire genomes that assemble from the environmental information that we're able to put back together about this group of viruses. What's interesting about this plot here is that when Muneer published this in 2014, he doubled the number of known genomes for this group of viruses. Now we've added a lot more since then, it's not just my lab, it's been a bunch of other labs, but not only can we see how their genomes are arranged, we can ask questions about how they are phylogenetically, we can also pile that functional information in and ask questions about when they're present and when they're not present. We can look at it this way. We can even go back to Narragansett Bay and ask questions about all of these viruses here, all kinds of groups of RNA viruses in the system. And so that's kind of interesting, but all that tells me is that there's a lot of viral infection going on. I don't know who's being infected, I don't know how frequently they're being infected, and I don't know how to begin to look for that yet. But what emerged while we were doing this was a statement from a large group of molecular biologists suggesting that researchers need to move away from the idea that if we don't have it in the lab, we can't study it, that if we can assemble these things in nature and get real genomes put together, uh, we can start to trust that information. This is a pretty monumental step. And so it led us to this idea that, hold on, we have all this information on all these different viruses. All the information on all their hosts is there as well. Is there a way to statistically put this information together and ask who is infecting who from all these different viruses and all these different hosts? And so what we try to do is use RNA sequencing information to recover association networks in the system. And the great thing was that in Quantac Bay, we have Oreococcus virus and Oreococcus. And if this approach works, the virus and host should associate by our statistics. So what we did is we used a bunch of math, which I won't get into, but it's based on the idea that if the virus is present, the host must be present. And if the host is absent, the virus, it can't be there either. And it's built in a variety of statistics on co-occurrence and things like that that I won't get into, but you take all of this information and you display it using network analyses. And networks look like this. And networks can be very small, they can have two or three or four members, or they can be really large. We have networks with 50, 100, 200 members, but we're interested in tying viruses to their hosts, just from the sequencing data, so the large networks really don't help us that much. So we've removed them from this here. And what you're looking at is significant networks from Quantuck Bay and Narragansett Bay. And there's a lot of information here, uh, and so what I'm gonna do is just drill down on a couple of these. I'm gonna start with this network right here. This network is exciting because it's got our host cell, Oreococcus in it, and our Oreococcus virus appears. This means our approach is working. We can actually put a virus and a host together in the same environment just based on sequence information. Now there's other things in this network that we don't quite understand. There's some single-stranded and double, or sorry, single-stranded RNA viruses and single-stranded DNA viruses in here. There's also a fungus here, but we often see things like chytrids associating with hosts that they may be predatory on. But we'll come back to this network a bit later. We can go over here and the story gets a bit more complicated. We see things that we predict. We see diatoms with single-stranded RNA viruses. All, or all, most of the viruses we know of that infect diatoms are single-stranded RNA viruses. So this makes complete sense. This did not make a lot of sense at first, having a dinoflagellate, the fire algae, the ones that bioluminesce, did make a lot of sense of having it with a giant virus here, although there is a report out of Japan now where somebody has isolated a giant virus infecting a dinoflagellate. So maybe we predicted their isolation or they isolated our prediction, I'm not sure which. Um, and then there's things here where we have like diatoms associated very closely with a Mimi virus. There is no evidence in the scientific literature that this happens. This could be a new association we're discovering um, if we pay attention to it. 
What's even more exciting then is that some of these networks become really small um, with just a couple of members and they start to make sense ecologically. So this is one of my favorite ones here. In this network we have a diatom. We also have this single-stranded DNA virus here. We don't really know a lot about single-stranded DNA viruses infecting diatoms, but we do know about them infecting fungi. And this fungus here is fairly consistent with a chytrid. As I mentioned earlier, chytrids can be parasitic on algae, and this chytrid, we think, is parasitic on this diatom, so they have an association, and so this virus, we think, is attacking this fungus. So this ecology starts to set up, and these things start to emerge. And we've seen this in at least one other system so far. So what have we learned? So what I've tried to show you is that we can use metatranscriptomics to make these big predictions. We can start to say from just sequencing data, different viruses are associated with different hosts. I really need to point out here, these are just new hypotheses that we need to go test now. But if you wanted to sort of build these relationships, if you can just in one broad sweep narrow them down, we think this is a good tool for that. What we need to do to test this tool is to try it in diverse locations with much greater sampling resolution. And so we've been doing that. We've been working with people at Oak Ridge National Lab and Project Spruce where they're looking at sphagnum fields up in Minnesota. You probably know that uh, sphagnum holds 20% of the terrestrial carbon and there's a massive amount of interest in how little bits of small changes in climate warming may lead to outgassing from sphagnum. So researchers, uh, David Weston, uh, Del Peltier, Joel Koska at Georgia Tech have been studying the sphagnum microbiome We've been looking at the viruses in the system. This paper actually just came out yesterday. And as you can imagine, the system is full of active giant viral infections. In fact, the giant viral infections and the RNA viral infections are much more abundant, it appears, than the bacterial viral infections, which is kind of inverting what we've thought for the last 20 years. We need to do a lot more work to prove that, but that's a new hypothesis emerging from this. Others, of course, are still trying to isolate new viruses. Last year we were introduced uh, by Eugene Coonan and others to Klosnia virus. I mentioned that some of these viruses have all kinds of crazy potential. Klosnia virus has 19 of the 20 tRNAs for essential amino acids. It basically can almost code its own proteins. As I heard one person say at a meeting last year, effectively these viruses are a ribosomal RNA away from being a living cell. So this is pretty exciting too. Um, as we look more and more into these systems, as we get better tools, we're able to put these stories together. So what is next for us? Well, we have a bunch of new projects using metatranscriptomics. We just received a new $1.8 million NSF award with Georgia Tech and Ohio State to go work in the um, Atlantic Ocean and ask questions about looking at who infects who. But instead of working on five or six samples, we're going to work on hundreds of samples. In parallel with that, we've got three new awards from the Department of Energy. Um, we'll have 135 metatranscriptomes from the Southern Ocean, 124 new ones from the sphagnum site, working with David and Dale at Oak Ridge, and 90 from these under ice communities in Lake Erie, um, asking similar questions. Now, I really want to point out that those first two things I talked about in Quantock Bay and Narragansett Bay were three transcriptomes and ten transcriptomes, and they took us months to process. We're now increasing the amount of information we're going to pull in by over an order of magnitude. But working with JGI scientists who have lots of fancy toys and big shiny computers, um, we hope to be able to do this. Now we're also still trying to discover new viruses. I'm just about done here. So this past summer, Eric Gann, who's a PhD student in the lab who's working on AAV, really wanted to isolate more closely related viruses. We've seen evidence that they should be out there, so our colleagues up in New York collected water samples during a bloom sent us water samples, and Eric had developed this, uh, I'll call it rudimentary plaque assay. It's not a great plaque assay, but it works, and that's what's important. And the plaque assay lets us pick up individual little viruses, these clearings here, and study them in the lab. The interesting thing about all these viruses that Eric has picked up is that, once again, just like 15 to 20 years ago, none of our PCRs are working. None of our molecular biology is working. We've happened along the idea that we have something very new here. We're not sure what, but as Eric pointed out to me a couple weeks ago, if we go back to our association networks from Quantuck Bay, remember this is the Oreococcus virus, this is the host here, there was these other virus particles in there. There were single-stranded DNA and single-stranded RNA viruses in this system. 
It just might be that we did not find a relative of the giant viruses. We didn't find a new AAV, but we found a totally different type of virus infecting Oreococcus. For us, that would be very cool because there are not a lot of systems out there that allow you to do ecological competition and understand why there are so many different types of viruses infecting cells. And we might be able to establish such a model system. And we're going to keep doing this. And I'm going to end with this slide uh, where we've gone back and we've looked at the scientific literature and we've asked a really simple question. Before we made all these observations, before we knew about chlorella virus and AAV and cafeteria roboergensis was up there and Mimi virus, scientists were taking electron microscopes, they were turning them on samples and they were seeing things. We've gone through the literature, we found all this evidence back into the 70s and the 80s when electron microscopes were really becoming common in university biology departments where researchers have reported seeing giant virus particles. All of these systems, as far as I know, um, remain more or less unstudied. So there's a wealth of new possibilities out there for researchers to go out and look for new viruses and maybe discover something new. Thank you very much.